Welcome everyone, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm very delighted today to present our uh, today's distinguished speaker, Professor Naomi Ginsberg from <laughs> University of California, Berkeley. Naomi is a full professor at the Departments of Chemistry and Physics. She has uh, completed her undergraduate degree at the uh, University of Toronto, did her PhD at Harvard with Michael Brenner, who we all know. Uh, uh, oh, no, 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 <laughs> Um, and uh, she completed her, she then did her postdoctoral training at the uh, Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Laboratory. Since uh, 2010, she has had her own group at uh, Berkeley where she uh, is studying uh, hierarchical material, hier multi layered hierarchical material with emerging properties. <laughs> you will see her research spans uh, kind of a beautiful combination from hard condensed matter to soft condensed matter physics to physical chemistry to even actually bio some biological materials. So it has a, she has a huge uh, spectrum of interest. Um, her research has uh, garnered her a lot of awards so from her DARPA Young uh, Investigator Award to uh, distinguished fellowships uh, such as uh, Sloan and Packard and many others. She has been elected APS fellow uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, you will see what, <laughs> what, what her research is about specifically today. I think she will be speaking more about the soft part or kind of soft ish. We'll get to both. ish. <laughs> yes. Uh, so definitely it will be about uh, nano assemblies or assembled nanomaterials. So I'm very much looking forward because from now on, it's always from a different angle, something very interesting and exciting. Please. Okay, um, well, thanks a lot, Alex, uh, for the invitation and the nice introduction. Um, I'm super excited to be here. We'll see how much uh, soft materials I can um, profess to learn and know. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to talk about following and controlling both the formation and function of bottom up assembled nanomaterials. Um, the formation part uh, will be the first part of the talk, and then the second part, which will be I, shorter, uh, will be the function uh, part of the talk. And the function in particular that we study in my lab is primarily transport, for example, charge transport, um, for which we've developed a number of uh, spatiotemporal approaches uh, to, to, to map at the nano scale. So uh, at the end of the talk, I'll show you all the latest and greatest about that. Um, but for a long time, you know, we've been doing that since my lab's inception, and uh, for a long time I'd get up and I'd motivate my talks by saying, well, especially for materials that are assembled bottom up, because the basic building blocks are more complex than individual atoms, uh, you know, the bonding interactions are generally somewhat weak, so we end up with uh, many different aspects of heterogeneity in the materials that are formed. Uh, and so it's really important to have the spatial, not only the temporal resolution to measure transport, because um, we need to be able to correlate the uh, anomalies of the structure uh, to uh, anomalies in the transport behavior. Um, and so fast forward a few years, and we actually started uh, correlating some of the structural properties uh, and defects to the emergent function of transport. Um, and so then I started upping the ante on myself and I said, well, if we have that information, then it seems like we have this moral obligation to then uh, figure out how to improve the structure so that you can improve the emergent function of transport. Uh, and so for that, uh, we started uh, getting kind of interested in um, the next part of this flowchart, which is uh, can we follow not only what the structure looks like in the transport, but can we measure uh, more about the assembly process so that we can iteratively try to improve it? Uh, and a particular system I'll describe in the first part of the talk, for which uh, I'll, I'll show this, uh, is this really beautiful uh, system of electrostatically stabilized uh, nanocrystals from my collaborator Dimitri Tilapin at University of Chicago. Uh, and these uh, self-assemble into these uh, very big, on the scale of nano at least, <laughs> structures, super lattices, so lattices of nanocrystals. Um, and what's very impressive about these in particular is that unlike a lot of the materials that are made out of semiconductor nanocrystals, 
um, these actually have very strong convergent function of canticorps, so they're highly conductive as well. Um, so, so that's what I'll talk about in the first part, but before I move on, I just want to emphasize something that's a little bit different working at the nanoscale as compared to, say, the microscale when we talk about self-assembly. It's really difficult um, to be able to model and, and predict what uh, the interactions between the nanocrystals are. Um, in this case, because of the fact that the molecules that surround the nanocrystals are not much smaller than the nanocrystals themselves. Uh, and so that leads to a lot of interesting and curious things. Uh, for example, the different forces at play, uh, so refractive and repulsive forces, are um, in some cases independent, uh, non-additive. Uh, and so if I go to my theory collaborator, David Zimmer, and I say, can you model and predict what, what should happen and how we should you know, develop an assembly protocol, he'll say, well, show me the data. Uh, so I really like that this is sort of um, experimentally driven and that like, we need to have that information. It's not so easy to just build a model for it. There's a second thing that's also really, um, I'd say, challenging working with nanoscale uh, objects and trying to assemble them into uh, ordered or functional structures. That's that we don't always have the same degree of control that we would like. We don't necessarily have a big parameter space uh, to play with. Um, and so just as an example, typical uh, semiconductor nanocrystals uh, might look something like this. So they're uh, held in colloidal suspension uh, using these long chain organic ligands. Uh, and then you can basically drive them to assemble into ordered lattices like you see here uh, by increasing the density. So for example, for, by evaporating the solvent. Uh, but the driving forces for this process are very largely uh, entropic. Uh, and we wanted to take uh, some inspiration systems where there are energy scales at play that give more latitude uh, in terms of opening up a parameter space to control the self-assembly process. So one such example that people might be familiar with here would be by uh, using depletion forces, uh, for example, with these polymer depletants surrounding you know, these microspheres. Um, uh, another such example that in the end leads to a somewhat similar interaction would be what if those polymers were themselves uh, proteins and you're trying to crystallize proteins, uh, their electrostatics is really important. But in both cases, um, you end up with a short range uh, interaction potential, short range with respect to the size of the particle. Um, and the phase diagram associated with that uh, looks a little bit more interesting uh, to me. <laughs> Um, so here I'm plotting this phase diagram, so this is the volume fraction, uh, so basically the density of the particles, and then the effective temperature here, so the thermal energy uh, divided by um, the depth of uh, this potential well. Um, and I'll come back to this phase diagram in a little bit. I've already labeled it for my system, so the colloid is like a, a oil or gas phase. Uh, SL is the super lattice, or the solid crystalline phase. Um, and then I'll, I'll come back to this metastable liquid because it'll feature prominently in the story I want to tell today. Uh, but all of these curves that you see here are uh, different binodals or coexistence curves. <coughs> blue, I don't know. Just left. I like blue. Okay. Um, okay, so the system uh, that satisfies these criteria of having these energy scales that might make it easier to control. Uh, in a meaningful way is the system that Dimitri and uh, his trainees, Igor and Josh, uh, developed, uh, where they replaced these organic ligands that you see uh, here uh, with these very short inorganic multivalent ions. Um, and the, the net uh, product of doing so is that you generate a lot of surface charge on the nanocrystals, uh, and you can basically, uh, you know, stabilize this uh, colloidal state through electrostatic repulsion, uh, but then by salting out or basically adding more salt uh, to um, the, the solution, it's possible to generate a nice, fairly shallow well with a short range. Uh, and that allows not only to form these really nice structures with very long range order, uh, but you can see that the uh, separation between the surfaces of the nanocrystals is very small. Um, and that, and the fact that they're not surrounded by a bunch of insulating stuff, um, allows them to be very conductive as well. Okay, so 
this property of being both conductive and having this long range order is, is really uh, anomalous. And I'm not going to take any credit for it. That's, um, that's um, something amazing that Antonici managed to do. Um, so we're interested in studying the mechanisms by which we can manipulate the phases of this system in order to you know, generate self-assembly, but not only in this case that works really beautifully like you see here, uh, but also for cases where it doesn't quite work as well yet. So uh, for example, uh, everything that I have told you about the system is true, uh, provided we're talking about nanocrystals that have a high dielectric constant. So for example, metals, or uh, lead sulfide has an anomalously high dielectric constant. Um, and that's because that recruits a lot of surface charge. Uh, so basically, you can wrap a lot of ligands to the surface. Um, if you use most other semiconducting nanocrystals that have dielectric constants that are more like 10, like cadmium selenide here, uh, then as soon as you add salt uh, to the electrostatically stabilized suspension, uh, the Van der Waals interaction just completely dominate and you end up with uh, a giant mess. So uh, I'll come back in the latter part of this segment uh, to this question of how could we you know, sort of democratize the self-assembly of these conductive structures, structures that have, uh, let's say, strong electronic coupling. Um, how could we allow that to occur not only for the high dielectric, but also the low dielectric? Uh, nanocrystals. And uh, the way that I'm interested in trying to do that is to develop uh, protocols that perturb the system, um, for example, uh, by photo exciting the nanocrystals. But I'll, I'll come back to that. In the meantime, uh, I want to focus on you know, what we can learn uh, by studying uh, the system that self assembles and behaves in this way. Uh, and the primary tool uh, that we've used in order to do that uh, is um, small angle x ray scattering. Um, which I suspect a number of people are very familiar with here already. Um, the, the idea is that uh, we're basically starting with uh, a colloidal suspension. Uh, in this case, I'll talk about lead sulfide nanocrystals and, and the ligands on the surface, these multivalent anions. It doesn't really matter what they are, but you know, this is the molecule, this is what they look like. Um, and then you know, there's some surrounding electrolyte, um, which is also uh, made of like uh, multivalent sulfide. Um, and so then we go to the beam line and we put our gas tight apparatus uh, into uh, the beam line itself. And you can see this is the yellow blue red here uh, that has our uh, dark uh, solution of nanocrystals. And then uh, we inject a whole bunch of uh, salt uh, into uh, that cubet. And then we watch what happens before, during, and after that injection process. And we try and follow this through until the system. Uh, reaches equilibrium. Um, and so this is, uh, I don't know, this is, uh, we do this over and over again. We measure, you know, once every like second or so, and each experiment can take anywhere from like 10 minutes to several hours. Uh, and, you know, all these plots that I'm showing here are um, intensity as a function of Q, the momentum transfer from the scattering. And so we're basically just azimuthally averaging what we measure on. OK, uh, so here are three uh, examples, first qualitatively, uh, of some of the data that we collect using uh, various different uh, conditions. So for example, changing the density, the concentration of the nanocrystals, uh, and also how much salt we add uh, to the system. Um, and now, uh, before I sort of get into analyzing those, I, I want to uh, come back to this phase diagram. Um, so I guess one thing that's important to point out is that here uh, I'm basically plotting what you might see as a function of the volume fraction. Uh, but because we have a, a liquid phase, uh, so something that is high density and low order, we need another order parameter. So if you imagine picking some point um, you know, here in the phase diagram uh, and just plotting like some free energy surface, maybe it looks something like this, I don't know. Um, but the main point is that uh, now we want to have you know, order and density both represented explicitly. And that gives us you know, the ability to sort of visualize this high density, uh, low order phase. Um, so now looking at uh, these three uh, different examples of data sets, um, the one on the left uh, corresponds to uh, 
not adding too much salt, so it's a fairly shallow quench and it's at a relatively higher uh, density. Um, and we see only the colloidal uh, contribution and also the super lattice contribution um, when we analyze these data. So we would call that a, a one step or classical nucleation process. Um, whereas if I look at a slightly lower uh, uh, nanocrystal concentration, uh, but also a fairly shallow quench, so not adding too much salt, uh, then I also see evidence of a liquid phase uh, showing up uh, in the data. And so that is what we would generally refer to as being a, a two-step nucleation process or a non-classical uh, nucleation process. And if the, the third data set here was quenching more deeply, uh, so you can see the peaks are broader, the core disorder, it's a bit more kinetically trapped, but that also looks kind of two step. Okay. Um, but we can get more quantitative with this. Uh, so uh, I was actually a little bit surprised. I guess it's a little bit surprising in many cases to see that there's a liquid state too, but um, but there are, there isn't a lot of like actual fitting of, of these sorts of data. But uh, Vivian and Christian, the two students in my lab who um, work full time on this project, um, put together uh, a, a model that they could use in order to fit the data, not only you know at one time, but you know, we can basically do this, like just following the whole process through so that we know how many of our nanocrystals are in each phase as a function of time. Um, I'll come back to the kinetics, um, but just looking at, you know, the end result uh, for each of the data sets I showed on the previous slide, uh, you can see with my color coding of the different phases that the outcomes are quite different. Um, so over here on the left, uh, the dashed green curve represents uh, the initial condition, so when we have only colloid, you can see that we don't deplete that particularly much uh, in this case, but we do generate um, in the super lattice drive peaks. This is an FCC lattice. Um, we do see the liquid, uh, so this blue curve, uh, showing up in both of these other uh, cases. Uh, there's more of it when we quench more deeply uh, because we suppress the colloid more too, uh, and there are various other differences as well. Um, but when you have all of this sort of information, and I can guarantee you we've done, you know, maybe 100 experiments, I, I don't know, uh, not just three, uh, you want to consolidate all of the information. And so one way that Christian decided to do this was um, by trying to put together the base diagram for the system. So here I'm not putting like all the data from all of our experiments, but in a self-consistent way, we can look at what happens with the three samples. And um, all of these, you know, arrows to represent the quenches here that I've been drawing on this cartoon, um, actually, <laughs> the space that we have accessible to us uh, is really a very low volume fraction, uh, just because of where we can stabilize the colloid uh, in, in, the, in the base diagram. Um, but you can imagine that for each of these pieces, and there's a lot of rich information all the way down here. Um, if each of the end points of these arrows is basically going into some coexistence region, um, then you know I should be able to sort of draw my tie lines and the densities that I see associated with each of the phases should be um, the densities that allow me to map the coexistence curves. So that's in fact what we can do in this particular case. Uh, the colloid fraction uh, over here, uh, we basically determine just from like how much is left in the colloidal phase. Um, the blue points here uh, associated with um, that met metastable liquid colloid binodal uh, are um, just taken from the uh, density we get for the uh, bits uh, for the liquid. And then we can, you know, just based on the position of the bright peaks, we, we can determine the density uh, associated with the super lattice or crystal phase. So that means that we can move from a cartoon like this uh, to something that's a little bit less cartoon like uh, and we really know like quantitatively you know like where these curves are and this gives us predictive power that we're really excited to be able to leverage um, especially because in principle this should teach us what we need to know uh, in order to be able to um, invert and get information about that elusive interaction um, there's also another way uh, that we can try to get at interaction potentials, and that's using uh, XPCFs or X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy. 
Um, so FPCS is uh, basically, uh, we're basically firing coherent x-rays uh, at, let's say, uh, a diffusion uh, colloid like this one here. Uh, and we have a pulse chain of these coherent x-rays. And the detector is measuring just as fast as the pulse chain uh, so that we measure fluctuations in the speckle pattern uh, on the detector. Um, and we can pick out for any given point uh, on the detector for a particular value of the momentum transfer. We can determine the time autocorrelation function to know what the decorrelation time is uh, for that system. If you want to do this with nanocrystals, because they move fast because they're small, um, there's only one place in the world where you can do this right now, and that's at the European X Fellow uh, in Hamburg. Uh, so that's where we went um, just over a year ago uh, to do some experiments because they have these megahertz <laughs> rate um, X ray bursts that they can supply. Uh, and so this was really exciting. It allowed us to do the first XPCS measurements uh, on, on nanocrystal uh, colloids. Um, and you know, we were able to extract the analysis is rather complex because you have to worry about what the x-rays might be doing in addition to just measuring um, but in a nutshell uh, we get decorrelation times that are just under a microsecond we're pretty confident in these because they correspond to hydrodynamic diameters that are basically just a few nanometers larger than the core size of our nanocrystal which is about six uh, nanometers across um, and so that's really cool. You can see we're kind of pushing the time resolution of the instrument because we're using small particles. A lot of the time, um, people are using, let's say, particles of order of magnitude larger, and so they're moving more slowly. But we can also constrain uh, with like speckle visibility analysis. That would constrain with like zero point two. Um, because we have this predictive power with our phase diagram, uh, in addition to uh, being able to measure uh, the, uh, the correlation time, uh, this is actually, this is rate, by the way, but it's just the inverse, um, uh, of the colloidal suspension, we can uh, prepare the metastable liquid uh, and do the same thing. Uh, and this was super exciting to be able to do. Uh, the time scale that we get in this case is about an order of magnitude longer. Um, which seemed reasonable to us. I was very excited to see these data because for a long time we wondered, like, is this a liquid or is this just an aggregate? And so now we know that these nanocrystals are actually diffusing within droplets of, um, you know, high density of uh, these nanocrystals. And, you know, there's a lot of XPCS that's done on liquids, but one thing that is kind of uh, cool about this is because we're using nanocrystals, which are larger than molecules, uh, we can actually measure on the characteristic uh, length and time scales associated with those individual constituents. Um, so, uh, okay, I already told you that these existed. Um, but let's see, the other thing I wanted to point out that's nice about doing this with x rays instead of, let's say, visible light uh, is that we can. Um, to measure the dispersion uh, and the relaxation rates for the system, and we can therefore have more confidence in the difference between the colloid and, and the liquid uh, um, fluctuations that we're measuring. Uh, and Christian was also interested to see how that would compare with what we might predict with molecular simulation. Um, and this is a little bit of a busy plot. We're basically measuring all the way down here in this corner. Uh, but we do see um, that uh, we get these um, smaller relaxation rates for the liquid than we do for the colloid, and also that if we had an aggregate, we would measure something completely different. Okay, um, so everything I've talked about so far is focused on thermodynamics, but I just told you like we can measure the time evolution of the system. Uh, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that time evolution. So these are from the same uh, three uh, classes of experiments or sets of conditions that I showed uh, earlier. Um, so for example, in this case where we did a shallow quench at a higher density, uh, you can see that there's this interconversion between uh, the colloidal and the super lattice phase on a time scale of uh, three or several minutes. And there's no evidence for any liquid that's present there. Um, then if we look at a shallow quench at a, a lower density, um, we see a very rapid interconversion between the colloid and the liquid phases. And then um, 
uh, there's this timeline before we start to see any of the super lattice emerge. And then at this deeper quench, uh, we basically obliterate the colloid very much instantaneously. And then over you know, a few tens of minutes, we see this very clear interconversion between the liquid and the super lattice. Uh, so in terms of one step and two step nucleation that uh, I mentioned before, so this is decidedly you know, one step. This is decidedly two step, especially since we see the separation of time scales to go from colloid to liquid to uh, super lattice. Um, and you know, this is maybe somewhere in between. Okay, uh, so again, we have more than three experiments. We want to be able to classify them and go a little bit further than this. Uh, so, Vivian basically took all of our data, which again, you know, come from parts of the phase diagram that are at a very low volume fraction. Um, you can see that we took a lot of data points here. Uh, hopefully that signals that there's a lot going on. This is a really rich part of the phase diagram to look at. Um, and the one step part would be between um, these two binodals here, whereas the two step uh, data that I'm showing are down here. Uh, and um, if you don't believe me that, like, I'm not just saying this because we have access to that part of the phase diagram, but <laughs> Uh, so in, you know, like uh, computational studies for um, particles that interact with short range potentials, um, there are very steep gradients in both the, you know, the nucleation barrier and the corresponding nucleation rate that are at, at low densities. Okay, so um, we spend a decent amount of time studying all these data uh, along here uh, to try to understand the kinetics as a function of um, the volume fraction, uh, which you might think would scale quadratically, uh, but they won't exactly. <laughs> uh, so um, let me just say that, okay, so we, we, did, we did like an Abramian crystallization analysis on these data, basically pulling out, um, you know, what is the fraction of nanocrystals that are found in the super lattice phase as a function of time, uh, and then extracted the rate constants uh, from that. Uh, so like a Brahmi rate constant from that. Um, and so these fit very well to what we would expect when we put in all of our uh, factors of density and the kinetic free factor and, and so forth. Um, and I'm plotting here not only what we obtain if we do this with the super lattice uh, phase, but also if we do the same thing with the liquid phase, which is shown in blue. Um, so what this taught us is really quite um, interesting. It basically, uh, tells us that um, converting from liquid to super lattice is essentially variable or very close to variable, uh, and the rate limiting step is condensing to a dense phase in the first place. Um, so this has interesting uh, repercussions. I would say it means that you know, instead of drawing this sort of cartoon of uh, the energy surface that looks like this, all of these data that we've collected here with this purple arrow. Um, Sort of correspond to having like a trench here that has maybe a little, little bump. Um, so there are a lot of cool things that we can conclude uh, based on uh, analyzing the kinetics that we measure at the beginning. Uh, so I guess uh, the first is that we have both one step nucleation, two step nucleation that we have access to, but also what um, I guess these guys would call uh, effective one step <laughs> nucleation. Uh, namely, it's this paradox that um, the kinetics look one step, uh, but you need to have liquid, the intermediate presence at the same time, uh, in spite of that. Uh, and then um, the other thing that is obviously very interesting these days about uh, looking at non-classical nucleation processes is whether uh, they present opportunities to accelerate the crystallization rate, uh, which we suspect is happening too. Okay. Um, so that's uh, the kinetics uh, in a nutshell. So I talked about the dynamics and the kinetics of this uh, system of lead sulfide uh, nanocrystals that are electrostatically stabilized to start with. Um, that's where we can super uh, we can assemble them into these nice super lattices. Now I want to return to this question of you know what if we wanted to do this with other types of semiconducting nanocrystals as well, um, and so. Uh, I think the most important thing um, to emphasize uh, in order to address that question is, um, you know, the surface charge, uh, because we believe that there's a lot more uh, surface charge 
just because of like a higher amount of ligand grafting density uh, with these high dielectric nanocrystals than for low dielectric ones. Um, to unpack that uh, in a little bit more uh, detail, uh, so uh, when we have um, high surface charge, we can measure like Xavier potentials, but it, it's actually a, a somewhat challenging measurement to, to do and trust. Another proxy for the amount of charge that's on the surface of the nanocrystals, um, which is facilitating this nice process of self-assembly, um, is to look at uh, the solvation shell that's around them. Um, so our model for what we would see there is not only these like very highly charged, let's say blue ligands that are sitting on the surface of the nanocrystals, but that we generate this over-screening effect um, that uh, also shows up uh, when we measure the uh, pair correlation function using wide-angle X-ray scattering. So here, uh, this is basically just looking at um, what gets templated by the surface uh, of the nanocrystal. So we see uh, these charge correlations um, uh, on high dielectric uh, nanocrystal surfaces, but not on low dielectric nanocrystal surfaces. So in the context of self-assembly, um, with this system that I've primarily been analyzing for you uh, with lead sulfide, um, how does this all shake out? So the dielectric constants of lead sulfide is quite high, it's 170. Uh, we're using a, a solvent with a dielectric constant of about a factor of two smaller than that. Uh, and so basically as we add uh, salt uh, to the solution and we create um, an attractive potential well, we have a lot of control by which we can assemble structures with the okay, the liquid, in some sense, even though it accelerates things relative to if it weren't there at the same exact um, you know, conditions, um, it does act as a sort of kinetic buffer that allows a lot more control than we would have otherwise. Um, we've done as many experiments on um, a system of gold nanocrystals with the same molecules grafted to the surface uh, in another solvent, and here because the gold is a conductor, uh, this ratio of dielectric constants is infinite. Here we still get assembly uh, into super lattices with long reach order. Um, and this has also allowed us to you know, compare these two systems and, and estimate to some extent more about the nature, the relative nature of the interaction potentials. Um, but we don't have nearly as much control with the gold system as we do with the lead sulfide, partly because uh, it seems like uh, that metastable liquid colloid binodal is, is suppressed to a, a greater degree. Now if we come over to the low dielectric nanocrystal side of the picture, um, because the dielectric constant is low and an electrolyte is poor by its very nature, um, usually this is, you know, um, this ratio of dielectric constants is lesser than one. Uh, and that's why when we add salt to destabilize the electrostatic repulsion between the nanocrystals, we end up with a diffusion limited aggregate. And so this is something I really wanted to change. I wanted to find a way to make cadmium selenide nanocrystals and their solvation shell look more like lead sulfide. And so being me, uh, I decided we should fire lasers at, at our nanocrystals. Um, and so we haven't done this yet with cadmium selenide nanocrystals, but we have with the high dielectric lead sulfide counterparts. We basically ran self-assembly experiments where we deeply quenched the system to generate something with a lot of disorder. Uh, and then, um, you know, compared what happens when we illuminate the system and photoexcite the nanocrystals during this process versus not. Uh, and um, lo and behold, we slow the kinetics and, and we make nicer looking super lattices with higher crystallinity. Um, and, you know, we've played around with modulating um, the optical field on and off. Uh, and there seems to be various aspects of reversibility uh, in what we're doing there, uh, but we're like continually annealing the systems. Um, so we're going to go and collect more data. What I can say at this point is that we're certainly elevating P-star. You might argue that we're keying the sample. I'm going to show you uh, some reasons in a moment why I think there's also an electronic effect. If you're increasing transiently the dielectric constants or maybe even the surface charge. Okay, um, so 
what we'd really like to see happen would be, you know, take our cadmium selenide that had basically no charge correlations uh, at, at its surface and turn it into something that looks like these charge correlations that we saw at the lead sulfide surface. Um, and so we repeated these sorts of experiments, um, but uh, in this case, uh, comparing what happens when we photo excite the nanocrystals while we're doing it versus not. Um, and not only do we see an enhancement in correlation with the lead sulfide nanocrystals, but we start to see correlations with the cadmium selenide ones too. So I'm really excited about this. This gives me a lot of hope that we can now manipulate that uh, low dielectric nanocrystal system in order to push it into different uh, phases or states that cannot be accessed through equilibrium assembly. Um, we've also uh, been doing some work to try and look at the photo-induced solvation, so basically look at perturbing the system with ultra-fast light pulses and measuring the wide angle scattering uh, that comes from that. Uh, and very preliminarily, we see, I'd say like, uh, I think that book, but I don't really want to go into all the details of this data. I want to make sure I, I tell you more about some of the other things that we're working on uh, in my lab too. Um, so maybe to summarize this part, um, I guess, uh, you know, what I want to emphasize is that by trying to you know, enrich the phase diagram that we're working with, we've been able to really, um, you know, have a lot more control over a nanoscale system and its phase behavior than is typically the case. We were looking specifically at this uh, system of electrostatically stabilized nanocrystals from Dimitri's lab um, that assemble into uh, highly conductive structures that he likes to call uh, strongly electronically coupled. Uh, I characterized all of the uh, thermodynamics uh, of uh, the system for you. So we looked at the different phases, the phase diagram itself, the fluctuations of the different phases. That gave us the predictive power to really mechanistically study uh, the kinetics, so the dynamic evolution of the system, where we were able to access these three different uh, pathways, uh, both classical and non-classical. Uh, and, and this is exciting for a nanoscale system. It means you can dial in, you know, like the size of what you create, how long it takes to create, you know, how crystalline it is, and, and so forth. Um, so that's all very exciting. Uh, and then in terms of democratizing, you know, the process of assembling into uh, these structures with long range order and high conductivity to like all semiconductor nanocrystals, which have like many more applications than just like sulfide. Um, there are a few design principles that I feel like we've learned. Uh, so first, by comparing different systems, uh, we've been able to zero in on the sort of balance that we need between dielectric constants of the nanocrystals and the surroundings, um, and basically how much uh, we manipulate um, you know, the ionic strength of these solutions in order to balance up the Van der Waals interactions to be able to control the assembly process. Um, and then in terms of the photo-induced work uh, that we've recently started doing, uh, we're quite confident now that there is an electronic effect going on, that this isn't simply due to heating, uh, and um, we have a lot more work to do, uh, but uh, I'll come back in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, I want to just return to this one flowchart that I described at the very beginning uh, on the introductory slide, just to say that Right now, we're sort of doing all these different arrows, but we're sort of doing them independently of one another. And what I'd really love to be able to do is to have, have this work like you know, a control system of some sort. Um, I would love to be able to pull the data that's coming you know, off of our measurement, like or get the measurement data, use that as an error signal in real time, uh, or as close to real time as possible to feedback on some target so that we can decide intelligently how to manipulate these optical fields. Um, so that seems hard, but I still want to do it. If you're interested, uh, you should come talk to me. <laughs> um, but uh, for now, uh, let me just say that um, one of the most difficult things to assemble, but that's really paid off, is this amazing team of people uh, that works on these experiments. So just due to the experimental complexity, it takes a lot of us to be have meantime um, 
So in addition to a lot of folks from my lab and from Dimitri's lab, um, so I mentioned David uh, uh, Limmer, our theoretician, uh, on this project uh, at the beginning uh, of the talk, and then also Sam Teilbaum at ASU is really like an expert guru, and uh, it's been super fun working with him and many of the beamline scientists that we sort of collected <laughs> along the way who've become collaborators of ours. Okay. Um, so now let me talk more briefly about um, transport. Um, so we basically talked about the assembly side of things, and now I, I want to move over to this emergent function side of things. Um, and when Dimitri and his lab measured the transport of these uh, assemblies of gamma crystals, um, he did bulk transport measurements, as well as you might expect. But I would argue that if this is uh, a material that's been bottom up assembled, it's not going to be completely regular, and we might be better off studying it, looking at uh, location by location, because of various heterogeneities in the material. Um, and for those sorts of measurements, both on that system or many other uh, systems where we're interested to know uh, charge transport or other forms of energy transport, um, there are a growing uh, collection of techniques uh, that my lab and uh, a, a lot of other labs around the world have all been working on. Uh, that uh, You might hear called pump probe microscopy or ultra-fast microscopy or transient microscopy, um, but whatever you call them, I like to call them optical stroboscopic energy flow microscopy because it's more descriptive. Um, we all do certain things in common. So for example, we all start by photo exciting a very small uh, spot uh, in a material. So we're basically creating energy carriers or charge carriers or heat or what have you. We do that by focusing through a microscope objective. And then irrespective of how we generate contrast in our microscope, uh, we measure spectroscopically the spatiotemporal evolution of that initial distribution as a function of time. Uh, and so uh, there are lots of ways to do this. You can you know, basically photo excite and then with some laser pulse and transmission uh, measure what happens. You can measure the photoluminescence of the photoluminescent material. We've dabbled in both of those, but I'm going to focus on most recent work, which involves optical scattering, or you could think of this as transient reflectance. Um, the reason that I like to think of it as optical scattering as opposed to transient reflectance is because um, we were inspired by um, interferometric scattering microscopy. So this is very similar to digital um, holography. Um, so here the idea is to uh, be able to measure the um, very sensitively, you know, the location of uh, and presence of individual very small particles. So each of these is a single protein. Uh, and the way to do that is by measuring the light scattered from the protein at, at the field level uh, by homodyne detecting it with light that's just reflecting off of you know, like a sample uh, medium and substrate interface. Uh, and that makes it much more sensitive, for example, than dark field microscopy. So this is for measuring particles. We wanted to measure quasi particles, so basically photo excitations that we create. Uh, and so in order to do that, uh, we just photo excite our sample first, and then we use that eye scat uh, as a probe. So that's why we call this stroboscat. So here's our little photo excitation in blue that we make with one laser beam. And then the eye scat uh, probe that we use uh, has a much uh, wider field. Um, I mean, it's like covering more territory on the sample. Um, and, and we're doing the same thing. We're detecting the light that scatters from wherever we deposited our energy. The reason that we can see that is because um, we're basically sensitive to index of refraction changes. Uh, and you know, excited electrons, for example, will change the index of refraction. Okay, uh, so we've been able to use this to very rapidly triage through a lot of different um, uh, conducting and semiconducting materials, especially uh, we look at a lot of emerging uh, semiconductor materials. Uh, we've been able to look at um, organic, inorganic, etc. Uh, we look at uh, charge carriers, we look at bound electron hole pairs or excitons, we look at heat transport, we can see sound, I'll show you ions if I get to the end of my talk. What's on this plot is basically the mean squared expansion uh, as a function of time over many decades of 
do this initial uh, photo excited spot. Um, and very quickly, we can you know, measure um, the, the mean squared expansion with a single digit nanometer CCTV. <coughs> Here's an example of just one movie uh, looking at a polycrystalline semiconductor material. That might look hard to interpret. For now, I just note that you have both light and dark contrast about this sort of a gray background uh, because it's a particular metric. Okay, so um, I'll show you what, what that actually meant. <laughs> uh, and also, like a few very short vignettes associated with electronic transport and materials. And the materials I'll talk about here are um, halide perovskite. Uh, semiconductors, which have become very um, competitive uh, as um, self-assembled semiconductors uh, that are uh, rivaling the power conversion efficiencies of uh, silicon uh, for photovoltaics uh, these days. They're just not as stable, so there are a lot of people working on that. Um, so in these polycrystalline materials, there was this uh, confusion over how charge carriers could get from one crystalline grain to another uh, when um, measurements of the interfacial resistivity across grain boundaries was infinite. Uh, what we discovered uh, by basically correlating the bright contrast here to the grain boundaries in the material that we can also measure in situ in the same microscope uh, is that the charge carriers were going deeper beneath the surface of the film in order to find a place where they could cross from one grain to another. And so here is another example of where the interferometric aspect of the technique was valuable. When looking at the transport laterally, uh, we could see that based on these sort of pauses that show up in the mean squared expansion as a function of time. So you'd see diffusive behavior, then some sort of pause, and then more diffusive behavior until all the charge carriers drop. Now we can see trapping in a lot of other uh, contexts in um, various other uh, sort of structures of these materials. So here are these bundles um, of ultra-thin wires of this material uh, where uh, studying the transport and seeing the trapping taught us that uh, basically each of these individual ultra-thin wires is like perfectly crystalline. It's just the end facets that are the problem. Um, there are other examples, uh, I guess, I, I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. I want to show you a few things before I close, uh, the upshot is that, you know, we see a lot of anomalous behavior that doesn't look perfectly diffusive. It's piecewise in various ways. And we're starting to get good at being able to parse what is due to what sort of defect, whether it's a point defect or a, a ring boundary or what have you. Um, and so this is really becoming an incisive tool to correlate structure with function. So that was all electronic aspects of transport. Um, here are uh, some examples where we were uh, also looking at thermal transport. The reason that we're interested in heat uh, is because anytime you photo excite anything with a laser, you generate heat. Most of the time with like optical spectroscopy, you can't see that. Um, but it can be impacting what it is that we're measuring, either what we're interpreting, uh, and whether that's correct, uh, or it could actually you know, cause problems in thermal management. Um, so James in my lab some time ago um, had <laughs> assembled films of uh, the gold variation, those nanocrystals that I spoke about in the first part of my talk. Uh, and first what he found is that if there were voids in the materials, uh, the heat transport that he measured was subdiffusive. Uh, but when he used those special ligands uh, on the surface of the nanocrystals, what we <coughs> discovered is that uh, we could see these ballistic sound waves that were emanating from where we photo excited the sample. And so this taught us that um, the, this composite material was not only strongly electronically coupled, but also strongly um, mechanically coupled. Um, so that's one sort of thing that you can learn. Um, another thing that's been really uh, helpful is that you know, in materials where you're interested in the electronic, or in this case, excitonic transport, like in um, uh, some of these more recent 2D materials, so transition metal dichalcogenides, um, you'd like to understand the transport, um, but the heat is ubiquitous. Uh, Hannah discovered uh, a way to use different wavelengths 
uh, to probe a sample where she could either see only the heat, which is shown in black, um, or heat and uh, also the excess bonds. And by doing some somewhat uh, you know, thoughtful arithmetic, um, extract uh, the contribution that comes only from the excess bonds so that we can determine their transport properties as well. Uh, in the process, we discovered that if you measure temperatures, the temperature elevations, down to about uh, like a, a 100 millikelvin. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that because this gives us a way to look at energy transduction between like one form of energy uh, and another. Um, and you know, here's another example where we see heat and charge transport happening um, uh, at the same time. In this case, in an anisotropic material where we're able to see how structural anisotropies map onto um, functional anisotropies with the charge uh, carriers primarily going in one direction along one crystal axis and the thermal transport primarily happening on another crystal axis, which could have some important implications for things like thermoelectrics. Okay, um, so I think that I'm not doing very well on time. Is that true? You have a few minutes. A few minutes. Okay, so I think I'm, because of that, I'm going to skip a little. Um, we've done some benchmarking work in silicon. There's just lots of animation. We can see very mechanistic things like carrier carrier scattering, but I don't want to talk too much about that. Um, here, uh, we, um, we also see heat and charge in transition metal oxides. So there are other semiconductors. Let me just say about these that transition metal oxides are. Uh, a candidate for photoelectrodes for um, solar fuels generation. So basically, uh, can we um, can we scrub CO2 from the atmosphere and use sunlight in order to uh, reduce it in order to form uh, small molecule fuels? Um, and um, and basically, these materials don't corrode when you try and do that. They've also allowed us to start seeing peculiar uh, non-equilibrium effects, like looking at non-thermal distributions of phonons at short times that uh, we're interested to figure out how to mechanistically study with uh, stroboscat. Um, but um, another thing that I think is kind of neat and maybe more relevant to the slower time scales that I was talking about in the first part of my talk is using very similar approaches without photo exciting anything the other side of solar fuels generation is not the photoelectrode, but like being able to watch what you're making. So here we're not watching yet what we would make in the process of CO2 reduction, uh, but we were able to show that we can use the same physical principle of changing the index of refraction by, in this case, introducing different salts uh, to uh, uh, a solution uh, and applying a bias um, to measure uh, ion transport, so basically the diffusion of ions as they're coming off of the electrode as a, a product in uh, a simpler electrochemical reaction. Um, so hopefully that will find use not only in solar fuels but in other contexts of our lab as well. Both this and the photoelectrodes is what I would refer to as like artificial photosynthesis. I talked with some of you earlier today about natural photosynthesis. So. Um, Maybe just to like end off, I'll say this is a problem that I've been interested in cracking for my entire independent career. I really want to know why in the very first picoseconds of photosynthesis, light is absorbed in one spot inside of a plant leaf, inside of a chloroplast, and so forth. Uh, and that energy in the form of a bound electron hole pair knows how to make its way to a dedicated location that uh, initiates all of the biochemistry. We don't understand why this process has near unity quantum efficiency. We really like to know why, because we don't know how to do this synthetically uh, ourselves. And so I've wanted to develop all of these spatial temporal transport techniques in order to just measure it. Uh, and now this is preliminary data, but for the first time, we actually have a measurable signal. Um, this comes from organic spinach from Trader Joe's. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, we're basically comparing here what happens if we add an herbicide to it or not. That just like elongates the diffusion length. Uh, there are a number of different things that we can do next. We can look at the ways that uh, nature tries to regulate these processes and, and various mutants that our collaborator Masa uh, is able to supply. Uh, but I'd also like to see uh, how in those processes heat is generated 
uh, and whether we can detect that heat that's generated to like harmlessly dissipate excess energy. Okay, so uh, to summarize this um, optical part of my talk, uh, optical scattering is tricky because you see everything, whether you want to or not, um, and at the same time, um, you can really leverage that if you work hard at it. And I feel like we're starting to be able to see different species that we're uh, generating, be able to distinguish them from one another, uh, and there's a lot of work yet to be done. And whereas in most of these stroboscopic microscopy, people are focused on electronic forms of energy, it's exciting now to be able to look at ions and ion transport uh, in a range of uh, new problems and also to look at these thermal effects. And that is also helping us to get to some of these more um, short time, like picosecond time scale non equilibrium effects that I briefly alluded to. Okay, so with that, hopefully, we see that we're trying to get through assembly, structure, and function. Uh, and I'll close by thanking my research group and collaborators for their talent, dedication, and resilience over the past uh, several years. And thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes, please. Uh, what's the power of the laser that you use to excite your talents? What's the power of the laser we use to excite which? Uh, the crystals. The crystals? Yeah. Oh, somebody asked me that yesterday too, and I didn't know the answer. Um, I... I'm just trying to get a sense of how much the temperature... Oh, so but we have measured that. Oh, um, nice. the The temperature elevation is at most like... Yeah, it's really, we, we wanted to check, and so I had a summer intern who basically focused on just that. Yeah, so we're, we don't think that that's having a, a very big effect. In your um, experiments on crystallization kinetics, um, and you quench, um, can spinola decomposition be playing a role there? Um, Initially, when we went to do that megahertz XPCS experiment, we, we basically wanted to move this way across the yes. diagram and look yeah, that for would it. Help. Um, and what we found is that, um, well, we did do that. You saw I showed you all the data we <laughs> went across, and that was like preliminary to try and figure out like where are the binodals. Uh, and it seems like everything is just so like crammed together uh, at low density that that we we. We, we can't find the spot where we know we're like between this bit of I guess that's. Have you looked for it in the, yes. just in the static, in the, in the x-ray scattering? The yes. Yeah. You don't see it. Yeah, and we don't, yeah, we don't see it. Um, but I mean, basically, if, yeah, I, I mean, I think there are other systems where we might be able to, um, but in this particular system, we haven't. But, yeah, we really thought it would be cool if we could do that. We were hoping we might be able to do the XPCS to look for like um, pre-nucleation clusters and and to follow, you know, like basically determine the distribution uh, as a function of time in order to answer that question, but it didn't work out. <laughs> to follow up on that directly, so what would be the frequency that you would need the XPCS? Yes, uh, for that to be. So you said you're at megahertz? Megahertz. Yeah, would it be necessary for this type of resolution to go even faster, or do you think that that's the... Oh, gosh. Um, that is an interesting question. Um, I don't think you would need to go faster than mm -hmm. that, right? Because, like, we can measure the, the characteristic yeah, see, she has like his and they're all separate, yeah. um, and and so like when we start building one, that's what we're gonna get. So you, you already have the result. And, and for how long is your measurement? For how much time do you measure sure. overall? Uh, so like how many bursts, or like yes. for how long? Uh, so each measurement is like a few minutes long, but like the bursts are at um, uh, ten hertz, mm -hmm. um, and each burst has like we, we ended up just going fifty pulses, so that we didn't. Sample and then there's a there's basically like a, a heating analysis that we do and then we get our uh, relaxation rates by extrapolating back to certain pulses. Yeah.
So do you have the pair correlation function for the uh, nanoparticles in the uh, concentrated liquid phase and in the dilute, so the vapor-ish phase? Can you, and you've also got the liquid structure theory to explain that. Does that mean you can back out the, uh, the potential of mean force and see if it is a pairwise additive? Uh, yeah, that would, I would love to do that. But the reason that um, the challenge is, okay, so with the XPCS measurements, uh, the signal falls off like uh, two to the minus four. Uh, and so we get a little chunk of the dispersion, but it's at fairly low Q. Um, so if it were at higher Q, um, we would be able to do exactly as you suggested. And so part of the motivation for doing the molecular simulation, even though it was coarse grained, right, is that um, you know if we can match that with the experiment at low Q, then we could, in principle, follow it out to high Q because like that peak in the structure factor or would correlate to like a dip in the relaxation rate, and so. Yeah, I don't know how to get to higher Q and get the signal to noise ratio with like then like the constraints of doing the experiment. But that's what we were hoping. You guys are just discovering helping everybody discover all the things we were hoping to do. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you were hoping for them too. <laughs> do we have any more questions? Well, if not, let's thank Naomi again.